the early scientists were convinced that nature was intelligible. It could be understood by the human mind because the human mind had been made by the same mind who had made the natural world and had imbued the natural world with reason, with a kind of rationality, regularity, and design that we could understand, that there was a principle of correspondence between, as the physics, uh, the, the Cambridge physicist John Polkinghorne used to put it, the reason within matches the reason without. You know, the, the, the reason the, the, the we have been endowed with certain assumptions about reality that allow us to process sense data, a la Kant, and, uh, and those assumptions are reliable because they were given to us by the same creator who created the world to work in accord with those, those assumptions. Hey everyone, um, my name is Anthony Costello and welcome to the Kirkwood Center podcast for Theology and Ethics. Um, we have a very, I, I've gotten to, into the habit of saying we have a very special podcast every time we record one of these, but I, I would have to say that this one is pretty special. Um, and I'm joined today by Lenny Esposito, a uh, fellow at the Kirkwood Center and someone who I don't, Stephen, do you think we could say of you someone who needs no introduction or is it well, i don't think we've reached that point yet okay but you not could, yet you don't need to introduce me for uh, but anyway yeah well we're joined by dr uh, stephen c meyer um author of um many good books um a fellow at the discovery institute in seattle uh, an organization that i've been supportive of for many years and greatly appreciated and uh, well, we're going to talk about several things with Dr. Meyer today, uh, certainly his new book, which is right here, Return of the God Hypothesis, which Steve, I gotta say, I almost, I almost feel this one could be like entitled Summa Apologetica Scientifica. I mean, it was, it's quite um, the summary of all of the scientific evidences that we have for a the theistic design uh, to the universe. Um, but Stephen, before we get into the book itself and some of the metaphysical and theological implications that um, this uh, theistic design argument would entail, I got to ask you some questions about just what's going on right now for you and for discovery and for the ID movement. I mean, we've watched you over the years go on to university campuses and debate, you know, sort of so crusty old intellectual types and, um, you know, seen some of your your battles there. Um, now, all of a sudden, you know, we see on the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, Brian Callen, and this has got to be quite a quite a shift in the sense of really opening up some new avenues for you, for your work, for the work of the Discovery Institute and intelligent design in general. Maybe you could just um sort of give us you know an update and what what you think is going on there just sociologically a little bit well i think sociologically there's a much greater interest in the god question um uh, i did a um interview last fall with peter robinson of uh uncommon mm -hmm. knowledge he's uh his show comes out of the hoover institution at stanford he was at a conference i attended in italy and he did a, a three-way interview with uh, Douglas Murray, Tom Holland, and me about the God question. And and Doug Douglas and Tom had been describing themselves as Christian atheists, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that um, they both lamented the loss of a Christian foundation for culture, uh, but couldn't quite get themselves over the line to 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 believe in to actually believe in god and i think there's a whole class of what i've been calling the new new atheists who have uh who aren't angry at religion they sort of miss it and and um wonder uh, <clears throat> you know lament that the, the west is failing because it's losing its judeo-christian foundations um but the, themselves are not uh believers now after the interview with peter robinson 
Tom Holland told me, well, I'm no longer an atheist, he said. So he's, oh, he's right. moved in a very decidedly theistic and, and even Christian direction in his thought. But uh, I, I think that's just indicative of what of what's going on. Uh, Justin Brierley, who has a wonderful program in, in the UK, or did until recently called it unbelievable. And he's interviewed so many different people about the the uh, ver various facets of of um, uh, Christian theology or theistic belief, uh, and it, it has done these kind of debates, you know, uh, on air. Uh, but he's got a new book out about the the surprising rediscovery of God that people are, are you know, after the early two thousands with the the intense focus or interest in the the case of the new atheists. I think there's a sense that those folks have overplayed their hand, and um, and that actually there's a, a lot of good evidence pointing in the opposite direction. I mean, the, the, the main argument of the new atheists was that science properly understood undermines belief in God. And yet, if you look, read their books carefully, they're not really addressing the sorts of evidences that uh, that um, I've been putting forward in Return of the God Hypothesis, the cosmological right. evidence that they have a very thin treatment of fine tuning. And um, even Dawkins, Dawkins has this wonderful uh, quote where he says that the universe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no purpose no design nothing but blind pitiless indifference and yet two summers ago a new animation came out from an australian group of the um, the dna replication system and dawkins himself professed to be knocked sideways with wonder or with <laughs> or wonder. disbelief yeah, at, right. the, at the at the the digital information processing system at work inside the cell these are th these the, the things we're discovering inside cells uh from just the, the brute fact of the digital code and dna to the even more elaborate uh, characterizations that scientists have now been able to make of the of, of the exquisite um uh, functionally integrated information storage transmission and processing system it's at work uh, on a miniaturized scale in cells it's it is mind-blowing it's not at all what you'd expect from from uh purely materialistic processes that were blind pitiless and indifferent it's it it looks for all the world like a design system and so i think there's both an evidential and a sociological uh, uh turn that's 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 i think reopening the question of certainly intelligent design i i think we're attracting more and more high-powered scientists to the the, the intelligent design re research effort and research program, but I think just more broadly in the culture, I think there's a sense that perhaps the wheels are falling off in various different ways. We have these mass shootings, we've got teen mm -hmm. suicide and, and anxiety rates through the roof, and uh, maybe it's maybe it's time to reconsider, um, yeah. you know, this sort of facile setting aside of of uh of belief in in god that was part of the 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 new atheist push from say 06 to 2015-16 where i think at some some po at some point in the last few years there's been a waning of influence and a sense that um in some cases even in some of the more prominent spokesmen are even becoming sort of figures of ridicule especially in the uk where they've really they really overplayed their hands so um, I mean, that, that's just one facet of yeah. it. I, I, there's so many things going on in the culture, but as far as you know, the media interest that that I think that's that's just an indicator of of, of what's going on. Well, and of course, the new the new technology and and just the what what opens up with regards to you know sort of podcasting and and YouTube and the new media being kind of the source of our public conversations now as well right well, right i i uh you know when i did the last book um darwin's doubt it was there was there may have been some podcasts in there but it was yeah. just getting started early, early 2013 yeah. and i did you know a couple hundred um talk radio interviews or you know c-span book tv and that sort of thing and th that, all that stuff still exists but the, the podcasting revolution has been extraordinary and of course um the uh, it's a week now since the the joe rogan interview went live and i can tell you my phone has just been blowing up you know people right. <laughs> heard from in a long time have seen it and i don't have to tell anyone that 
that uh hey guess what i was on this program called joe rogan everyone tells me that they well, see, saw we've it. been following you from the beginning so yeah. we didn't call yeah. you. actually i i think i i asked you to come on you were before, into id before, before id joe got rogan. Cool, <laughs> yeah. yeah well and this actually brings up a, another question you know it, it famously the the dover case what was that 97 something like that oh, it was um, 2005 but yeah that's uh, that's a, we, we are we are nice. We are so much further along than that. And and I'm wondering, because we do see a groundswell in uh, popular culture, I'm wondering if um, if that were to say, play out, do you think some of the, the um, variables that kind of fed into that case would be different today? Well, I, I, yeah, quite possibly the um, the the. the, the Staunch Darwinists after the Dover case were were dancing on our graves, saying it's over after Dover. Um, perhaps not realizing that many of the most prominent uh, people in the ID movement elected to stay out of that trial. Uh, Scott Minnick and Mike Behe did testify to defend their own work on the irreducible complexity of molecular machines, which had been maligned by the some of the ACLU witnesses, but um, I chose not to testify. And part of the reason for that was we just thought the whole thing was very poorly framed. Mm -hmm. The uh, The local school board, which was, I suppose, well-meaning, had, um, you know, a fairly innocuous policy of uh, having teachers read a statement telling uh, students that there was a book in the library that discussed the theory of intelligent design, um, you know, and ought to have been a yawner. But, um, there were a couple of things about it that the, the way they framed the policy that we didn't like. One is that it did mandate uh, uh, that the teachers read this statement, and um, uh, we, we thought that was probably a bad idea. Uh, but more importantly, at the at the hearing where the policy was was being discussed and advanced, one of the board members uh, encouraged other board members to do this for the crucified one. And uh, so this was an explicit statement of religious purpose, which by the lemon test we knew was not going to pass muster in the court. And it was, of course, completely unnecessary and superfluous to what was being discussed, but that's what was on the record. And so we had urged the school board to withdraw the policy. And, um, uh, but there was a non-for-profit <clears throat> legal group that wanted to have the fight. And, you know, and so the fight went on with the ACLU and, and so it was just kind of a train wreck, um, but I chose to to stay out of it, even though part of the discussion legally is the definition of science, which is a, an area of special interest to me as a philosopher of science. Um, fortunately, the, the case has only legal standing within the, this one central district in Pennsylvania. So on a national level, the the uh, the, the the legal standing of of teaching about the theory of intelligent design not indoctrinating students into it or any other um, idea. The te teaching about it is, is, is remains to be clarified. Um, we have not been pushing that. We've been much more concerned to advance the case for intelligent design and to use intelligent design as a guide to research at the highest levels of, of, of scientific discourse and, and research. And so um, that's uh, the interesting thing, though, is that many of the the books that have really put the ID case um, on the on the map. Um, I mean, there were some good ones before, but there's some good ones that have come, and the 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 that the, the we've had a number of high level scientific conversions to our point of view uh, since Dover. I think I think Dover is just way very far in the rearview mirror, and it and there it's anything but. The case that it's over after Dover. I think the ID the ID research community is growing. We're attracting lots of young talent. We have young uh, former students who are now tenured professors in their own right, um, and we've got books and articles. The number of peer reviewed articles uh, about that time in 05, um, the first peer reviewed article advancing intelligent design had just been published in 19, in 2004. That was the piece that uh, I ended up. Uh, I wrote that was published at the, at the Smithsonian. Uh, we're at about 200 peer-reviewed articles now. Mm. And so th this is, uh, it, it, I, I think that's just an unstoppable force in the sense that 
nature is testifying in ways that are making lots of people see what we see. And right. it, it, at a certain point, you just can't suppress that. And I think that's what's happening. So the movement is really say, growing from within at this point. It's not just, you know, you're knocking on the door and trying to say, look here, look here. But there's there's now it's no, grown. We're not in, worried about in, public school battles, you know, that yeah, the, right. We have advanced a, a policy that a number of uh, state boards and uh, local school districts have adopted, which is if you're going to teach Darwinian evolution, teach it well, which means teaching the arguments for it, but also the arguments and evidence that challenges the theory as you find it, as you find those arguments and evidences in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. That's just a matter of scientific literacy. At the college level, there are plenty of professors who raise the ID issue. Mm -hmm. They've got academic freedom or should and um and and honestly you know the 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 um we just have too many people breaking through into the or or senior professors who have come to our position our our perspective who already have secure positions and so it's it's getting harder and harder i think for the other side to suppress this and some of the key public spokesmen for darwinism um, are either, you know, into retirement years or no longer active. And so it's, it's, I, I just think, you know, the people that want to suppress discourse have, have moved on to other issues. And, um, um, I, I think, yeah, you know, younger scientists are still very aware. They hold our point of view. They've got to be careful, uh, within their department context and, you know, that, that sort of thing. It's, but, um, uh, there, there's a lot of great stuff being published, good books, good peer-reviewed articles, good research projects. We've made key predictions about, for example, junk DNA that have been confirmed by uh, independent studies. So I don't think it's over after Dover. Okay. Well, well you, make a, you, make a, you make a good point, though, when you talk about the definition of science, because, you know, it, it, first of all, it's notoriously difficult to define what makes science. But if you take a, a Karl Popper approach, there, there needs to be a level of falsifiability. And what is the falsifiability of the evolutionary paradigm? What's what's the, you know, if you're going to do science, don't you have to have a counter to the evolutionary model? Well, you know, Popper famously developed uh, the falsification criterion as a as a normative definition of science, he then noticed that that uh, both Freudian psychology and Darwinian evolution were a notoriously uh, capable of slipping the noose and, and avoiding falsification, not because the predictions that or empirical expectations that they had were being confirmed, but because there were easy auxiliary hypotheses that you could always attach to the theories to uh, allow them to avoid falsification. I personally don't think that the Popperian characterization of how science works is accurate. Uh, I think lots of theories can easily add uh, auxiliary hypotheses that will allow them to explain why the predictions that they've made or the expectations about data that they have are not what you observe. It might be that uh, there was a, if you're in a controlled laboratory environment, it might be that uh, your predicted, um, con the predicted consequence of your experiment didn't occur because there was something wrong with the experimental apparatus or that the wind was blowing or the sun was in your eyes or that there was a, an interference of some kind. And many times that's been exactly the case. Um, Newton, uh, you know, had a prediction based on his theory of gravity uh, um, about planetary orbits that didn't uh, come true. But scientists didn't abandon universal gravitation. They they proposed that there might be another planet out there that was perturbing the orbits of the interior planets. And lo and behold, uh, Neptune was later discovered. So falsification, as at least applied rigidly, is not really a hallmark of scientific status. And um, and so that applies to to Darwinian evolution, and but it also applies to intelligent design. Lots and lots of people, and I, I can't. If I had a nickel for every time someone goes on the Facebook page and says, "Well, how is ID falsified?" Well, I, I think that that's the wrong standard. 
um, you if you apply it to ID and say, well, ID is not falsifiable by one by one single test experiment, you can do the same to Darwinism. Mm -hmm. I think rather better model of how scientific theories are tested is what um, the, the Cambridge uh, philosopher of science, uh, Peter Lipton, called inference to the best explanation, that it's a matter of the preponderance of evidence and it's a matter of comparing explanatory power or and or predictive success. Popper placed all his emphasis on predictive success, but good scientific theories are adjudicated in more than one way. They're adjudicated by their predictive success in some cases, but especially for historical scientific theories, they're adjudicated or evaluated or tested by reference to their explanatory power vis-a-vis uh, -vis their competitors. There's a comparative aspect to theory evaluation. And, uh, and if you're talking about uh, historical scientific theories, you're often talking about events that took place a long time ago. So you're not making predictions, rather you're trying to explain often uh, data we already have. And, but that, that also takes place in physics. For example, there's a, 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 a very astute uh, historian of science uh, uh, who was at uh, University of Maryland named Stephen Brush, who did a really careful study of uh, the reception of the theory of, of general relativity and found that it had been widely accepted by the physics community before the so-called um, crucial experiment involving uh, light bending and eclipses and so forth in 1919 with Arthur Eddington. That was a prediction that the light bending, the, the, the ability to detect the bending of light was a prediction of general relativity. But it, uh, Brush points out that it had already been widely accepted because of its ability to explain what were already known facts of physics at the time, anomalies that had been unexplained on a classical approach. So um, explanatory power and predictive success and uh, an awareness of uh, the preponderance of data and the, 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 the success of one theory over and against another. There's a comparative aspect. Inference to the best explanation implies that there are competing hypotheses that may not have may not be able to explain things as well as the hypothesis that's that's uh, on the table. And anyway, the point is, if you apply whatever standard of demarcation you apply in this debate, whether it's uh, falsification or best explanation or repeatability, if you apply the standards, well, this is what I found in my research on the demarcation problem as it relates to the question of biological or cosmological origins. If you apply the standard rigidly in such a way as you would, for example, exclude uh, intelligent design from co being considered science, oh, it's not falsifiable by a single predictive test, turns out that if you apply that standard to Darwinism, it will also fail. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you if you apply a more realistic standard or characterization of how science works and say, well, is is intelligent design a scientific theory? Uh, it turns out that if you apply a, a, a realistic standard that would it will will validate one of the the approaches to origins, it will ine in inevitably validate the other. So the point of all that is that you can't use these abstract standards of scientific status. Uh, or definitions that purport to define science normatively to settle the empirical <clears throat> the empirical question about what actually happened to cause life to arise on earth that's right. an empirical question anyway long answer well but it's you good though that, that, that talking about up the problem of the criteria right yeah, yeah. there's a yeah. problem with the criteria it's usually applied too rigidly and yeah. if, it, if it disqualifies newton then you know uh, if, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure what 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 it really tells us about it what science qualify basically everything then. Um, yeah, well, I, okay, I just um, talked to an historian of science this week, yeah. a French historian of science, who said, you know, that uh, you know, Pierre Duhem and uh, but m many historians of science will, will will point to the 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 moment when Newton unified the heavens and the earth by desacralizing the planets. And getting rid of the, he, he got rid of the Aristotelian, Aristotelian idea that the planets were being moved by spirits, by individual spirits, and that therefore the the quintessential realm was different than the sublunar realm. And uh, he said, no, 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 we, that's a. He had both a scientific and a theological argument against that. Turns out that he thought it was 
it was uh, the, the pagans were guilty of idolatry by making the, the individual planets essentially gods mm -hmm. and um and instead he unified the heavens and the earth by arguing that there was a single set of laws that applied to nature across time and space right. and many historians say that is the moment when modern science began um now Right. We're, argue, we're basically saying that. We, but the point is, if if Newton's approach yeah. is in the view of many scientists, the th the thing that is the hallmark of, of of modern science, then if you have a demarcation criterion that disqualifies Newton, you maybe better rethink your demarcation criteria. There goes the whole project of of modern there science. Goes, yeah. Yeah. Sorry right. about. That. No, that's fine. I well, there's several. Okay, I want to try and. <laughs> you've already said we've gotten so much information already. I want to already draw some things together. So we talked about the waning of what we might call, you know, I always felt like um, the new atheists were kind of the last gasp of logical positivism, you know, and we see then, you know, there is an, a, there's an existential crisis in the culture. And all at the same time, uh, people are now, you know, deeply concerned about the collapse of, you know, Western culture and the moral standards that Christianity had imbued into the culture. You know, we have all of this emerging evidence from science itself to suggest, well, wait, you know, there's a metaphysical basis here um, that, um, you know, we don't have to reject anymore um, uh, within the scientific community. So it's kind of an opening back up to um, what I what I always thought was, you know, and I think I mentioned this to you when we met the the is you talked about Newton, the original project of science, right, was not a it, it more it was more of natural what was called natural philosophy, right, and it, metaphysics was part of scientia, you know, and then metaphysics and science got separated in the early modern period, and then we wind up with so one of the well, let's well, get to yeah. yeah. Yeah, supposedly separated, but what is well, metaphysics? Right. Metaphysics is a subdiscipline of philosophy that's concerned yeah. about being, about what is reality. Does science make claims about reality? Well, sure. So then, then that's how right. do you how how do you uh, create a strict demarcation between science and philosophy? You you can't. Right. You can't. And, and this, is, this is the fallacy of the 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 demarcationist program. And but that is a consequence of logical positivism. The idea that there was a special method of reasoning that set science apart from all other modes of discourse, and therefore and therefore also conferred upon science a kind of special epistemic status that scientific knowledge was somehow better than all other forms right. of knowledge. Right. And. What but I've those shown those my... philosophers had quite an impact. We talk about uh, if it was Quine or or Ayers. Well, AJ AJ yeah. Ayer, you know, but but logical positivism blew apart within yeah. philosophy because it couldn't, uh, for many many reasons, it didn't provide an adequate characterization of how scientists actually work. Right. Uh, or if it's own, what, if it's which is what Michael Polanyi showed in 1958 in his masterpiece, Personal Knowledge, but also its definition of uh, um, uh, of what knowledge is, uh, you know, the idea that you you uh, that in, in unless something is logically undeniable and empirically verifiable, it can't be known. Well, uh, could that standard, could that statement be known? Was it logically undeniable or empirically verifiable? No, it had a problem of self-referential incoherence that didn't take long for philosophers to to notice. Self-defeating, yeah. you know. And so I remember being at a conference in 1986 with A.J. Ayer, who was, you know, famous for having been one of the founders of logical positivism. And obviously it went back into the 19th century as well. Um, but in, in the 20th century, he was he was the guy, but he was kind of a in this conference. I you know I was young right out of school, but I I but it was pretty obvious that he wasn't being taken seriously by anyone. He was kind of a sort of court jester figure at this mm -hmm. conference, otherwise very also very prominent academics. It's just that his the idea he represented was already understood to not work within philosophy, you know. But yet, you know, the, the advocates of the new atheism are basically trafficking in that sort of right. uh train of thought. You and know? everybody, you know, who watched those, I mean, would send that um Dawkins and others were quite philosophically inept. I mean, they just were not up to speed on where 
on where philosophy was thinking that, you know, they're just assuming this kind of naive positivism, right? And uh, that really came out then when they would go up against, I think you, you or William Lane Craig or others. Um, so, okay. Um, I want to get, let's get to the book now, the new book. And I, um, you know, and we'll put in, I mean, this is your third, the third book that you've authored yourself. You have other books that you've co-authored like, um, like this beast here um, with our uh, friend and colleague at Talbot J.P. Moreland. But um, the new book, um, Return of the God Hypothesis right here. And I, I, I'm going to do my best Peter Robinson impression now. <laughs> and because I want to read, um, he's a talk. terrific interviewer, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, he's well, he's great. I mean, I'm not, yeah. So it will well, just be really, an impression. Really great American. I don't know if you know that, you know, he, as a 27 year old speech writer, wrote oh, yeah, no, I heard that. Yeah, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He, he wrote that Reagan speech, yeah, because yeah. I went to the Reagan Library recently, and that's it's it, that, that story is laid out there. I've heard a, a, a talk that he's given telling the backstory of that, it's absolutely fascinating. So. I, I think I watched that same talk, right? Right, yeah. well, and and so, and, and that's right, you have that interview with him, Murray, and Holland, who we also follow those gentlemen as well, and they've made quite a positive impact i'd say culturally um but let me read from the i want to read two two of the endorsements just because i want people to understand you know i mean here's one by uh brian josephson um Nobel laureate in physics talking about defining science this book uh quote from the back of the book this book makes clear that far from being unscientific intelligent design is valid science end quote. Okay, so that's from a Nobel laureate in physics. Um, and then I, I love this endorsement you got from, I don't know if I'll be able to say his name correctly, Eskelman? Oh, Michael Eshelman. Eshelman from Boston University. And you, you got to be pleased with this endorsement. It says with, quote, with this book, Stephen Meyer earns a place in the pantheon of distinguished, non-reductive natural philosophers of the last 120 years. From the great French savant Pierre Duhaime through A.N. Whitehead, Whitehead to Michel or Michael Polanyi. Uh, and, and it goes on, but end quote there. So tell us about the book. It seems to be sort of a magnus opus for you. You're, you're bringing a lot of threads together from your previous book, Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt. And you're making um, several conclusions that lead to a theistically designed universe. Yeah, well, I, I've been thinking about this since the mid 80s when I was uh, working at, at the time as an industry geophysicist and uh, attended a conference on um, the big questions in science, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, uh, the origin and nature of human consciousness. And I, I first, uh, because I met uh, a scientist, uh, Charles Thaxton, who had written a very important book about the origin of life and who uh, functioned very generously as a mentor for me. Uh, I the, Of those big questions, the one I took on first was the question of the origin of life. I did my PhD on the subject of origin of life biology, and uh, it took me a while, but I eventually produced a book, uh, Signature in the Cell, about the origin of life question and made the argument that the uh, evidence we have of design in the cell, in particular, the digital code present in the DNA molecule um, uh, is best explained by the activity of a designing intelligence of some kind. I extended that argument in uh, Darwin's Doubt by arguing that the many features of uh, animals, uh, in particular, the, the information that's stored in the cells that help them to be built, as well as the information processing system and the circuitry that's involved in animal development and many other, and, and even patterns in the fossil record also suggested the activity of a designing agent of some kind. In neither of the two books did I attempt to make an argument that the intelligent, the intelligence responsible was uh, a transcendent intelligence, namely the deity, um, I did indicate, I think, in both books that I myself had had uh, theistic leanings and was, in fact, a Christian, but I didn't make an argument about that. Um, many of my readers, after 
reading the first two books, naturally wanted to know, well, who do you think that designing intelligence responsible for life is? And what can science tell us about that question? And that's what I took on in the third book. Um, it wasn't a new question to me. I'd been thinking about it, as I said, since the nineteen, you know, mid nineteen eighties. Um, but I, what I did in the new book was uh, expand the data set um, to include cosmology and physics. And the reason for that is that there were and are scientists who have proposed that. Well, yes, we are seeing evidence of design in life, but isn't it possible that the designing intelligence responsible for life is an imminent intelligence within the cosmos, a kind of maybe a, a super intelligence on another planet, as a space alien? This is the hypothesis of panspermia, and that seems rather exotic, but no less a personage than Francis Crick proposed it in a book called Life Itself in 1980 or 81. And um, even Richard Dawkins floated the idea in his interview with Ben Stein in the film Expelled. I think he later regretted that, but nevertheless, uh, it occurred to him. And um, there have been other figures, uh, uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe and Fred Hoyle, that have have considered this as well. And so, if you think, if if you become convinced as I am, and, and I hope I made a convincing case in the first two books that there is in fact evidence of the activity of a designing intelligence in the history of life. Then it, the the question that's raised naturally is, well, is that an imminent intelligence within the cosmos or a transcendent intelligence? Is it an alien or God? Mm -hmm. um, and so I naturally wanted to look at the evidence that we have about design from the very beginning of the universe. And that's the, what we call the fine tuning, uh, the fine tuning of the laws and constants of physics and the fine tuning of the initial conditions of the universe. And I, and I think there's a very compelling case there to be made for intelligent design as well. But what's clear there is that 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 the the evidence of design that we have from the very beginning of the universe, when the fine tuning parameters were set, is not a, a class of evidence that could be explained by any imminent intelligence within the cosmos, because any uh, sp a space alien that evolved on some uh, future planet well after the beginning of the universe uh, would have evolved after the beginning of the universe and therefore could not have been the cause of the fine-tuning present from the beginning of the universe nor could such a being have been responsible for the origin of the universe itself and so i looked at both the evidence that we have for a cosmological beginning or a singularity at the beginning and evidence of the fine-tuning from the beginning and suggested that that class of evidence can could only be uh, explained by a transcendent uh, and therefore th theistic or deistic type of, of designing agent. And so then as I got further into the argument of the book, I weighed the explanatory power, not of specific scientific hypotheses, but of these competing metaphysical systems right. mm -hmm. of theism, deism, pantheism, um, uh, materialism, and and even variants on those worldviews such as panentheism and so forth. So, and there I argue that that surprisingly, perhaps, but uh, theism as We're a not. philosophical, <laughs> philosophical yeah. system uh, provides the best overall explanation of the evidence that we have about biological, physical, and cosmological origins, and that I call the return of the God hypothesis. Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, I want and I want to get to specifically when you after you eliminate um, the materialistic and even the pantheistic, which I thought was very important, actually, to uh, do an analysis of how a pantheistic worldview uh, matches up with the evidence, because I see some returns. Uh, I, I see some movements going on that are embracing a sort of a type of pantheism. And I'll talk about that maybe in a second, but I'm glad you did point that out as well as a possible hypothesis, but then where you say also show how pantheism fails. And then we'll get into some of the distinctions between the deistic or the evolutionary theistic versus the evolutionary um, theistic evolution uh, views versus the view that you're defending. Um, but um, just to take one step back, I want to talk about, because you mentioned Thaxton, who was one of, a mentor to you. 
And I think in the book, you say he and some of his colleagues, maybe Bradley and Olson as well, they were the ones to start talking about intelligent causation. Right. Um, and now I'm wondering that with regards to this, and we've talked about this, this artificial division between science and metaphysics, but there seems one of the main bones of contention from the naturalist is that we have to hold to some kind of methodological naturalism, right, in order to do science. So I can imagine an objection like if we start to talk in terms of agency involved in natural processes somehow, well, how can we scientifically um, talk about an agent that would have something like a free will? Because we can't really scientifically analyze a free being of that sort or a, a causal agent that has you know, freedom of the will. So how, how would we respond to something like that? Well, I think there's an asymmetry often in science between explanation and prediction. We can often explain something that we couldn't have predicted. Uh, this has been well noted by the great um, philosopher of science, Michael Scriven, in a series of articles in the late 1950s and early 60s. Um, and it's a well-accepted thesis, I think, within the philosophy of science. There's lots of examples of it. Darwinism, for example, can explain things that it can't predict. If you if you regard the mutation selection mechanism as the driving force of evolutionary innovation, and you want to say, and you you think that that mechanism provides a sufficient explanation for the origin of new forms of life, you nevertheless can't predict what it's going to do next. The whole point of mutations being random precludes the idea that you can you can make predictions. So Scriven was defending the scientific status of Darwinism by saying, uh, you can often explain what you can't predict. And it's a perfectly legitimate thing for a hypothesis to explain something, even if it can't make predictions uh, about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and agency has the same sort of, so, sort of uh, characteristic. We can predict we can't, we can't predict what a free agent is going to do, but we can we can predict, but not with certainty, because the whole notion of freedom precludes the idea that things are completely law governed and, and deterministically bound. Um, but we can explain events by reference to agency because we see we, we can detect clear signatures of the act, activity of agency and we do it all the time. You walk outside and you look at a stop sign, you know that that was put there by a personal agent because of the, just the very low level of information content that's in the sign. If you see a hieroglyphic inscription and you're, a, you're a, um, uh, an archaeologist, you know that that wasn't put there by wind and erosion. So we can explain uh, by reference to intelligent causes, even if we can't predict what intelligent agents will do. Mm -hmm. um, Good. So we are on the same. And there again, there, there again, you know, it's randomness. Or yeah, you're on the exact agency. same yeah. epistemological footing as the competing hypothesis of Darwinism right. or chemical evolution. Mm -hmm. You're talking yeah, about for forensic science trades in this all the time. I mean, that's the whole point. Right. You have free agents. It was this did this person pass on because of natural causes, or was there a free agent involved in yes. the yes. murder? Mur so. Exactly. And we don't we don't say, well, you can only consider natural causes. If you're a forensic investigator, you need to be open to anything that might have actually been in play. And, um, and this is the problem with methodological naturalism when it comes to, to addressing these questions of origins and some other questions in science, is that it's really begging the question. Um, the, 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 the thing we want to know is not what was the most likely naturalistic uh, explanation or cause of the event we're looking at, we want to know what actually happened to cause the event, and if an age, if it's if it's logically possible uh, that a, an agent was involved, then we need to be open to to to, to the evidence of such agency if it's there. Um, and and again, the analogy to something like the Rosetta Stone is very apt. Imagine you have a bunch of archaeologists looking at those inscriptions, and one of them tumbles to the realization that, oh, th that's three different languages. Those are three different informational scripts. There must have been there must have been an intelligent scribe involved. And the other archaeologists say, no, 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 we can't we can't consider that. It's got to be something purely naturalistic. Well, you're you're just shutting down the inquiry, you know, that that um it, it's prematurely and and uh, uh, that so you have a, a presuppositionally driven conclusion that may be at odds with the, what the, the actual evidence is telling you, and that same possibility exists when you're looking at the evidence 
concerning the origin of life. If we've got digital code and DNA and it looks for all the world like what we know only programmers produce, then maybe there was a master programmer for life. We can't preclude that consideration a priori from the outset of the investigation. We've got to look at what the, what the evidence shows. Right. It's an unnecessary and uh, then unfortunate uh, constraint. Right. On, Absolutely. On the, on the investigation into reality itself, the reality of nature. Um, excellent. Yeah, so it's at, least, it's at least logically possible that yeah. there, the personal agent and intelligence existed prior to the advent of life on planet Earth. Right. You know, may, maybe you have strong reasons for thinking that unlikely, but it, it's still it's a logical possibility. And therefore, it's an explanation that we need to be open to considering and refuting, perhaps, but certainly considering. And when, when you when you when you talk uh, throughout the book about the causal, the sort of causal options that are on the table for the for the things that we see, when if you constrain, if you constrain yourself to a, a, a metaphysical or methodological naturalism, you know, you have roughly two options, chance and necessity. Right. Or, you know, you say some kind of combination of the two. Yeah, Darwin, Darwinism typically combines the two with a, a, a random or stochastic variations plus a law like process of natural selection, whether it actually can be cashed out as a, a formal law mathematically in the way physics people uh, do or not is debatable. But it's it's law like in that it's a kind of a regularity. You know. Right. Right. Well, then those also seem to war against the. Uh, principle of sufficient reason especially that of chance at some point where you just say well the the laws of nature are the are the fundament period end of story um and then you you talk also throughout the book how laws don't generate um information information right i mean it's not laws. the laws that create the information that is needed right, for right. the natural processes to get going laws either describe our law that what we write down as a law describes regularities in nature that we observe but if something is a if something if some process is highly regular then from an information theoretic standpoint it it, it generates what's called redundancy the same thing over and over and over and over and over again sunrise sunset sunrise sunset um you know all unsupported bodies fall Drop, drop the wallet. Um, I could do it a million times. You get the, the same same input, same outcome. Um, well, that's not that's not an informative process. Once you once you've seen it once, you know what's going to happen again and again and again. But the the what we mean by information, it requires a, a, a freedom from law like determinism, where there are uh, there are contingencies at each step that could go one way or another. And so every time, um, so uh, an, an informational sequence, well, like the information we're generating right now is not reducible to a simple law or algorithm. There's a, it's aperiodic, it's complex, not regular. And, um, and it's, it's, um, uh, uh, does not have the, the qualitative characteristics of, of processes that are, are law-like. So there, there's this kind of uh, non-starter in origin of life research where people have said, well, maybe we'll discover a law that will explain the origin of the information in DNA. Well, if you discover a law, which the, the law is going to describe a highly regular process, but the information in DNA is by definition not redundant and repetitive. If it, if it was, you'd have a mantra, right. uh, AG, 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 rather than highly variable sequences of characters that are expressing information in accord with an independent symbol convention, right. which is very different than, than a law-like process. Well, and I, I think it's important to point out then at the more at the existential, this is also kind of the difference between the impersonal and personal, right? I mean, a law is just an impersonal kind of uh, description, but if you're getting a sequenced and complex message that's delivering meaning, then this, you know, starts to look like not just uh, a law-like process, but a but a mind, right? A per, again, back to agency. It's and I think that ways, yeah. it's one of the ways, maybe the key way that we detect the activity of a mind. Right, right, when, and, right, exactly. Which I think that's where people start to get nervous. <laughs> and when you say detect, you're talking about explaining the presence of something, in a sense. So if we go back to that 
explain versus prediction dichotomy. Mm -hmm. We can't predict what minds will do, but because we know the kind of things that minds typically do, when we see those things in particular, information rich sequences of characters, um, then we can infer that a mind was at work. We can retrodict what we couldn't have predicted. Right. Well, I appreciated your um, references to Claude Shannon and information theory. I grew up in a household of engineers. My father was um, in information theory for 40 years at Notre Dame. And I don't, I, I only started, I think I only started understanding what he was doing after reading the the parts in your book. So um, like, like he knew Claude Shannon personally and, and would talk about him, but I never understood it until I read the book. One of those certified geniuses. Yeah, of the next level. You know, right, exactly. And uh, yeah, Shannon and Weaver and, and Crick. And uh, so, yeah. Um. So, okay, I want to move a little bit more now into, well, maybe sort of questions about philosophy of science and gen more generally. I mean, again, so the book, go it goes through all the evidences from the fine-tuning cosmology, then the, the, the problem, the, the chemical problems, abiogenesis, and then, of course, into the problems in, in biological organisms with the explosion of novel body parts, combinatorial, combinatorial, uh, combinatorial problems, with the sequence space. So it's all in there. And of course, the best explanation that comes out for all these form sequences and structures and functions that we see in nature is mind, right? I mean, this is what we're, we're uh, moving towards, you're moving towards in the book. But now some might say, given that we're sort of living in a culture now that's at least at the moment dominated by, by what I would call a sort of anti-realism or social theory, and I would just say something like, well, scientific claims or truth claims at all are just uh, products of the communities that make them, you know, so this sort of idea that any kind of claim to truth is not really referential to an external reality, but we sort of produce reality through our language. And there is a strain of anti-realism with regards to science as well. And I wonder if you could speak to this. I want to, I want our audience, so I want Christians to understand this idea that there is an anti-realism about scientific claims and whether they're not just productions of the individual, the community, that this is kind of a problem, social construct theory, you might call it as well. And, you know, how, how would we respond to that sort of um, approach to, maybe that's just an approach to truth itself? Yeah, well, it's important to understand how, how the philosophy of science has ended up in this uh, epistemological cul-de-sac or dead end. Uh, the department I was in in Cambridge as a PhD student had some very prominent sociologists of, of knowledge who uh, believed that knowledge was indeed constructed, that there was no mind independent uh, reality or m certainly no mind independent reality that could be known in any objective sense. I mean, the obvious problem with that is that nobody actually lives as if that were true. Uh, they, they don't believe that knowledge is just a uh, a construct of a small group of people or a community that they happen to be part of, because there would be no reason to believe that that one construct as opposed to another is any more or less likely to be true. And therefore, uh, that that really there isn't a, a mind of independent reality because you've got different groups constructing reality differently. But yeah, we live as if there is one truth out there that has to be reckoned with. We, you know, going back to David Hume, a critique of his skepticism was that at the end of the day, he still walked through the door and not the window. Um, and the sociologists of knowledge the same, they must do that. So our philosophy of science doesn't match the way we live, which is to say, at some level, we don't really believe it. Uh, we, we live as though something else were true, that there is a mind independent reality that can be known. And so that then with that said, it, it then raises the question, well, on what basis can we trust the reliability of the mind? We're all living as though our minds are basically reliable instruments for knowing an objective reality outside our minds. And I think this is where, where again, theism has a great deal to offer as um, by way of explanation. And this was one of the, it's actually one of the reasons that the scientific revolution began in the first place is that the early scientists were convinced that nature was intelligible. It could be understood 
by the human mind because the human mind had been made by the same mind who had made the natural world and had imbued the natural world with reason, with a kind of rationality, regularity, and design that we could understand, that there was a principle of correspondence between, as the physics, uh, the, the Cambridge physicist John Polkinghorne used to put it, the reason within matches the reason without. You know, the, the, the reason the, the, we have been endowed with certain assumptions about reality that allow us to process sense data, a la Kant, and, uh, and those assumptions are reliable because they were given to us by the same creator who created the world to work in accord with those, those assumptions. So we have the, you know, Hume famously um, argued for skepticism uh, on the basis of, uh, of, you know, it's a fascinating little proof that he has where he shows that inductive reasoning um, depends upon a principle known as the uniformity of nature. Sorry about this little camera sliding. And, and the uniformity of nature can't be justified apart from inductive reasoning. And so he showed that, that we were stuck in a, in a, in a circle that, the, in, in circular reasoning um, if all we have to go on is empirical data. So he was a strict empiricist and he showed you, you couldn't prove either induction or uniformity from, from empirical data. But if you have a prior reason for assuming that the uh, for for thinking that the assumptions we make about the world are accurate to the way the world was made, you don't worry about that problem. And that was that was the case of the of the the early founders of modern science who believed that nature was intelligible. And in some ways, this goes back then to um, Augustine and his famous. Uh, credo ut intelligam, believe in order to know. If you believe first in God, then you have a basis for trusting in the reliability of the mind, and then science is possible. Right. The very ironic conclusion of late 20th century, early 21st century philosophy of science is that if you, if you uh, reject belief in God, you end up undermining confidence in knowledge in scientia and therefore you have a kind of strange binary choice believe in god and then you can know the world you can have science or reject belief in god and undermine the basis for knowledge about the world and therefore science so right. um, and, and this and, comes out yeah and, yeah, so this and, is, and you go through the history of that at the first in the first part of the book you really do a good job of laying out the history of how of theistic science, right? And then, right. Yeah. But all, also at the end, and I, I guess you're not quite to that point yet. And but I, I come back to this epistemological right. argument from the that it's a, called the argument for theism from epistemological necessity, and um, uh, and this this is part of what Alvin Plantinga's work is about. With I mean, it is what Plantinga's work is about in his magisterial. Ser, uh, set of tomes, the warrant and proper function, and showing that that naturalism um, conjoined with an evolutionary account of the human mind leads to a self-defeating um, account of the reliability of the mind, whereas theism provides an adequate basis for believing in the reliability of the mind. So this is the fundamental question at bottom in philosophy of science is on what basis can we or should we or should we not trust the reliability of the human mind and it was you know sort of the in modern philosophy the sequence hume followed by kant uh, and then into the more contemporary figures but it was you know hume showed that on the basis of pure empiricism we can't trust the basis we can't trust the reliability of the mind kant came back and showed that well Kind of amplified that thesis in a way by showing that there were structures of the mind. He called them the the, the synthetic a priori. The right. there was a dozen or so assumptions that we make about how how nature works, or uh, that are necessary that our mind necessarily uses to process the empirical data that we receive, and it's and and that's how we can we we construct. Uh, our understanding or images of reality, our sense perception is massaged by the assumptions that are built into our minds. Now, Kant believed we couldn't 
ask the question, well, on what basis uh, are those are those assumptions true or false? Because he said we have to use them to think at all. I think they can be cashed out as propositions. Um, all you know the, the the Kantian category of causality can be expressed as the as the proposition all, all events have causes, uh, and so in each of the propositions or each of the categories similarly can be expressed propositionally. Both their propositions. They can either they're either true or false, and we can certainly ask which, which is the case. And it happens, I think, that theism provides a reason to believe that the 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 categories of the mind that we use to process sense data are generally reliable. And right. uh, yeah. and so yeah. you know there there are there are things we can think about beyond the range of our sentence perception, or you know there may be some caveats or provisos that we may want to offer, but the, the, the general reliability of the mind for knowing the world as it was made is something that flows out of theism and eliminates the epistemological crisis, the problem of modern, of, of, of postmodernism. Yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and I, I think there's- I, often, I'm, a, I'm a theistic realist. Um, right. Yeah. Because I think there's often a, a misunderstanding of Kant there, and I, this would be getting deep into the epistemological weeds. Uh, maybe we'll do that another time when our colleague Doug Guyvet is with us. Um, but, um, you know, that uh, one of the best sort of explications of Kant that I've ever read was in Stuart Hackett's book, The Resurrection of Theism, where he starts off with Kant's uh, synthetic a priori. And he cashes that out in such a way where you get a, you know, a realism, you know, like you said, a theistic realism, you know, um, and, and the categories. Yeah, I, I, Kant made the, theistic arguments based on um, the, uh, he, he had an, a moral argument for theism. Right. Didn't right. make an epistemological argument for theism, right. but I think he could easily have done so. And I've right. known and that's what I think Hackett does. does. Yeah. Hackett then Hackett says... Then, yeah. Um, I, I had a, a friend in grad school, Eugene, Eugenio Biagini, who went on to become a very prominent his, history professor at uh, Princeton. I don't know if he's still there or not, but uh, I remember him telling me that he had become a Christian by studying Kant. That he, and it was the it, it was the epistemological problem that led him to the conclusion of theism. And this before I knew any of the scientific evidences for intelligent design. I become a convinced theist because of the argument from epistemological necessity. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's right. Um, because, you know, too, when, when, when you start with that, then it eliminates these, the two problems of the 19th century, which is either the emergence of scientism, which will lead to, you know, skepticism, or you mentioned briefly the di dialectical materialism, which is more the Marxist side of the, of the coin you know, that sort of places knowledge as just a pure product of the human will, right? Which is obviously also- a Social um, construct of yeah. groups, you know. I mean, um, the, the crude way of putting it uh, was, uh, you know, whoever gets the grant makes the theory, you know, <laughs> and right. so- it's, Or what, what was, um? oh gosh, who was the, I don't want to- There's obviously some, some sense to that. I mean, we can have a, a, a sociologically- Govern science, which is unhealthy. But the the point is, there's still a mind independent reality, and there are uh, we want the, the, <clears throat> if we only have uh, one perspective investigating nature, we'll probably only get one perspective at the end of nature. So this is the reason for the need to to um, cultivate a multiple competing hypotheses approach. So there is an element of competition, theoretical competition, in the scientific method. Uh, the Italian uh, philosopher of science, uh, Mar Marcello, Marcello Pera, he's not Irish, um, uh, says um, you know, science advances as scientists argue about how to interpret the evidence. So there needs to be this dialectical competition. Right, uh, right. More in the Platonic ensure, sense than in yeah, the Marxist sense, think, though, I think. To ensure we're considering all possibilities and getting to the best one, which is part of what I argue for in critiquing methodological naturalism. Me methodological naturalism sets de set, um, uh, suppresses that competition and uh, puts you in a situ situation where you may be where you may have garbage in, garbage out, where you assume 
the the outcome of the the investigation by the by by the rules that you set up at the beginning of the investigation rather than by letting the evidence speak. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's, it's not interesting. Just a, yeah, go ahead. Elaine. It's, it's yeah. interesting in the signature in the cell. You made a a point about talking about Frederick Waller and his uh, discovery of urea and how he had pitted himself against the vitalist and felt that their constraints were what was hindering his science. That that the idea that you can't investigate the the life forces isn't this the same in reverse? Yeah, I mean it. it, it have we come full circle now and, and, and aren't they doing that which they had initially complained about? Yeah, well, I, I had a great conversation several years ago with Thomas Nagel, the, um, the you know atheistic philosopher of science, who nevertheless became disenchanted with the materialistic explanations for biological origins. And uh, he uh, perhaps foolishly uh, wrote some nice things about my book in a commendation for the Times Literary Supplement in, in the signature in the cell back in 2009. And then he was attacked by fellow atheists for having done so. Uh, but he ended up doubling down and he wrote his own book called Mind and Cosmos, how the materialist neo-Darwinian uh, account of reality is almost certainly false. false. The yeah. and, um, and his point was, we know that minds exist. We know them, uh, as J.P. Moreland points out, by direct introspective experience. And any account of reality that eliminates mind as, a, as an important player, causally or otherwise, is impoverished. It's missing something. And methodological naturalism sets out to impoverish. It, it, it sets out, it, it requires us to investigate nature from that impoverished point of view mm -hmm. at the outset. Uh, we can't consider creative intelligence as having played any role in any of the things that we see around us and want to investigate. To include ourselves, uh, which then- Including yeah. ourselves, yeah, right. because we, so we have to give it a reductive account of our own minds. The plan, planning is- Very, very self-contradictory, because if we, that is to say, we conscious agents are giving a reductive account of our own minds, our, the account of our own minds is inconsistent with enterprise we've just engaged in it's it's very weirdly self yeah this is, so you got the self defeating if you take this the strict yeah. metaphysical and method natural you got a self defeating uh uh aspect to it there and then also you can't go the postmodern right i think i rorty was the other philosopher who, who who i think he said something like truth is what my colleagues let me get away with or something right right you know, and you have the bifurcation in the philosophy of science between <laughs> the anti-realist or sociology of, of, of sociologists of knowledge who want to say that it's all social product relative to persons and groups and socially constructed without referring to a definite mind independent reality um and then you have the positivists who are essentially just the children of hume who want to say that the only knowledge that we can have is knowledge that's that's uh, of empirical objects, the, the, the knowledge we can gain through the senses, but the problem is that the mind is active in in, in processing the, that sense data. There are assumptions that we make in order to do science that have nothing to do with empirical data, the assumption of the uniformity of nature, for example, that there are, there are faith commitments that are involved in science, and the pointing out of those faith commitments is what has led to the postmodern turn. Yeah. But if you have an independent reason for thinking that those faith commitments are reliable, and I think theism provides that, then you can avoid the horns of this dilemma. You, right. you and, can have you, you have a reason to believe that that you can know the world and that there is an, a, an objective reality there to be known. And uh, yes, there is a sociological dimension to that. One group can become dominant. People can have biases. Mm -hmm. They may have... Right unscientific reasons for holding a particular theory over another but you know that's that's the human that's also the human condition yes a, a theistic point of view after the fall but just as in in the realm of of government we want to have checks and balances in the realm of science we want to have theoretical competition because that's the that's that is the best way that we've come up with for gaining a closer and closer approximation to the truth without ever losing confidence that, that there is a truth out there to be known. Right. That's great. And what I think too, what we're seeing, what we're seeing, we talked about earlier at the beginning when you we were in 
with Murray and Holland, guys like this, that sense of now, either if you're on the on the positivist strain or the postmodernist, you know, there's an existential crisis that event inevitably occurs. You know, if you if you take those those routes to their fullest extent, and now and then, you know, all of a sudden. It's not just about meta, abstract metaphysics. It's about morality. It's about how we can how we put our societies together. It's about law and everything else. And then it really the rubber hits the road. I think it was uh, Isaiah Berlin who said all culture is a society trying to live out a metaphysical model. You know, testing out a metaphysical model to see then how it actually winds up working out. And you know, these 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 alternative nineteenth century views they're not working out very well. People see that they don't work out in the concrete, and then they take a step back and say, "Well, what happened? You know, where do we need to course correct?" So, okay, now I got it. We got to get to this. Um, this has been great. I know I want to respect your time, but we got to get to this more theological question now. Uh, you do talk in the book um, about some uh, figures who hold to a more, some people who hold to a more uh, a theistic evolutionary view dennis lemoreau uh lemoreau lemoreau is the gentleman that yeah. you mentioned specifically but I, I i know there are others i think peter van ingwagen has a view like this the philosopher of science and also i i, I think howard van till who was a theologian at i think calvin college this idea of you know and this has to do with what we might call divine action or intervention uh, to you know, so this sort of directly relates to the theological doctrine of God's providence, I would say. So tell us a little bit about these. Maybe some of them are deistic, but maybe they're more than deistic views. That these front-loaded views of God's design and how the the distinction these between those views and the view that you're defending, where God is more, or the designing intelligence is more involved in uh, supplying information in, in periods of history, new influxes of information. Right. Well, there are um, many different versions of what's called theistic evolution, or sometimes now the theistic evolutionists are calling their own view evolutionary creation. Um, and, that, and part of the reason for that is that there are many different meanings associated with the term evolution. Uh, evolution can mean change over time. It can mean universal common ancestry, that all organisms are related by common ancestry going back to one single form such that the history of life can be best depicted as a great branching tree. Um, or there's the idea that the process that produced all the change depicted by the branching tree is unguided and undirected. Uh, it is, or, or it, the, the process that produced it is the mechanism of natural selection and random mutations, variations, or similarly undirected materialistic processes. So it can refer to the simple fact of change. It can refer to a pattern, or it can refer to a process where typically the evolutionary theorists will affirm that the, 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 the process is unguided and undirected and the, and they will do that for a very important reason that's part of the law the, the logic of darwinism in the first place uh, the 19th century biologists all agreed that life gave the appearance of design there were things about living systems that looked as if they'd been designed by an intelligent agent darwin came along and said well i can explain that appearance of design as a result of an unguided undirected process namely natural selection it's not something like a, a, a human breeder or a divine uh, creator selecting uh, the attributes that are meant to that, that give an organism, make an organism adapted to its environment. Rather, there's a natural process that does that. So it's natural selection doing the work rather than an intelligent agent of any kind. And so this was part of the logic of Darwinism from the first in the very first place is that the appearance of design could be explained by a purely natural process. And so therefore, that process is unguided and undirected because if it's being directed and guided, then it's no longer apparent design, it's real design. But the Darwinists have wanted to say, uh, as D Dawkins says on the first page of The Blind Watchmaker, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. 
So this is inherent in the Darwinian program. Um, and so we've pointed out a number of things. Number one, if that third meaning of evolution is what's being affirmed, it's very hard to reconcile that with a meaningful notion of, of, of theism or certainly of, of a, a theistic creation. Um, if, if God is guiding, you either have a logical problem or a theological problem. If God is guiding the unguided process, after all, then it's no longer unguided, in which case that is actually a form of intelligent design, but the theistic evolutionists have typically been very critical of intelligent design. They reject it. Um, but it can also lead to a, a, a theological problem, because if you think that God isn't directing the undirected process, that the purely natural processes are doing all the work, then that leads to some form of div diminished divine sovereignty. Uh, God, it may be, as some theistic evolutionists affirm, upholding the laws of nature. He may have even acted at the beginning of creation, but from the beginning till now, he's essentially watching the process of creation from the mezzanine, passively perhaps upholding a basic law-like substrate for nature, but allowing the random mutations and the process of natural selection to do the actual work of creative of, of creation. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the view of the, the version of theistic evolution that I uh, and beyond that, there's the scientific problem, which of course is the for us the main problem. The mutation selection mechanism has very limited creative power, and this has been increasingly acknowledged by leading evolutionary biologists. I, I attended in 2016 a conference at the Royal Society. It was kicked off by a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Muller. And he started by enumerating what he called the explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism. And he had, he had five very formidable problems that he identified with a the theory. The principal problem though, is that the mutation selection mechanism does a very nice job of explaining small scale variations, but it does not do anything like an adequate job of, expl of explaining the origin of major morphological innovations, the major changes in form and structure that we see arising rather abruptly, in fact, uh, throughout the, uh, the, the fossil record. And <clears throat> so um, it's, it, 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 there's a kind of irony in all this, and this is a great push among uh, well-funded well theistic evolutionary groups um, to, to um, in a sense, baptize some form of Darwinian evolution or the, the extended synthesis or some purely materialistic evolutionary theory as the means by which God created at the very time when leading evolutionary biologists are questioning the creative power of the, of the main evolutionary mechanisms. Right, right. So this idea of, uh, well, so this idea that there God creates a self-making process. Or I think in, I don't know if it was in your book or in this chapter I read from Robin Collins, where he quotes Polkinghorne saying, quote, this is Polkinghorne, who I know you you also met in your career. A world allowed to make itself is better than a puppet theater of a cosmic tyrant. Now, there's something there in there, obviously, uh, about the problem of evil. I mean, we'll get to that in a second. But well, that, that, that's, a, that's an idea that applies nicely in the free will defense into the problem of evil when you're talking about agency. But but we don't think that quarks and electrons and planets and rocks have agency. I have conscious, so right. We, well, yeah. I, we're I, I, with respect to Sir John's work in physics and the, in the theology of physics. But on that particular point, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical and think that that's a misapplication of um, the, the free will defense applying in a, in a sense, making a free will defense of um, theistic evolution. You know, God is allowing nature to create itself and giving it, it agency separate from himself. And that's a, a mark of divine benevolence. I, I, I just think that's... It's yeah, and, sort of, and Colin uh, so, points that out in his chapter in the Oxford yeah, Handbook. I think it's a confused it's application yeah. of, of, of that strategy of theistic argument. Um, but it really doesn't address the, the key problems that we're addressing, which are primarily evidential. And I once had a chance to ask um, Polkinghorn, I, you know, you've, you've been so persuasive in making these design arguments based on physics, on the fine tuning. 
and yet arguably the complexity that we see in biological systems even exceeds what we see in those wonder those exquisitely finely tuned physical parameters why aren't you equally supportive of the design argument biology and he told me just candidly that he didn't know biology as well and he didn't feel comfortable commenting on it and he felt he needed to defer to the expertise of the biologists and our point is that there is really no consensus now about how the evolutionary process worked that's completely broken down if you read frontline people who are working in evolutionary biology they will acknowledge the same problems that we're uh, highlighting in our books um you know nobody knows how you get a new body plan from an old body plan given that to to build a body plan you have to have a developmental gene regulatory network which is a tightly integrated um circuitry for controlling cellular signaling that's necessary during animal development so um and what we've learned is that those those gene regulatory networks cannot be perturbed significantly without destroying animal development and yet you need them to build animals so yeah. just real simple visual aid circuitry to build animal a cannot be altered significantly but to build animal B from animal A, you need a new developmental gene regulatory network. You need new circuitry. But if you can't alter the pre-existing circuitry to build that new circuitry, how will you ever get animal B? And this is a problem that was highlighted by Eric Davidson, the Caltech uh, developmental biologist who um, made this exhaustive study of these uh, developmental gene regulatory networks. Basically, they are uh, systems of genetic control that involve genes producing signals that turn on other genes at just the right time to service new cell types as they are differentiating one from another during the process of animal development, where you go from one to two to four to eight to 16 to 32 to 64 to you know, a geometric expansion in the number of cells. And as you're doing that, you're getting more and more different types of cells coming online. And when new types of cells arise, they need specific proteins to service them. If you're a gut cell, you need a digestive enzyme, et cetera. And there's a whole system of tightly regulated genetic control that is responsible as choreography. Yeah. And when you map out the functional relationships, it looks for all the world like an integrated circuit. And I've got pictures of, I got the picture of that in, in the book in chapter 15. Now, nobody, not the neo-Darwinists or any other newer model of evolutionary theory has solved this really fundamental problem. And the reason for that is that all models of evolutionary theory involve change. They involve changing something into something else. And the one thing that we know about developmental gene re regulatory networks, which are crucial for building new animal body plans, is that you can't alter them much without shutting down animal body uh, animal development altogether. Mm -hmm. It's the, so, the constraints problem of engineering. The more tightly function, uh, more tightly integrated a system, the more difficult it is to perturb any part of it without defect to a whole. Now, people that know about problems like that are not making facile statements about how God used the evolutionary process to create. Because the, the fundamental thing you want to be able to account for in the origin of in the history of life is the origin of new body plans. That's morphological innovation. And there is an there is a, a mechanistic impediment to doing that in a gradualistic evolutionary way that we have discovered. That Which problem would be is necessary for the front loaded view to front loaded view or, does not solve that. The, yeah. the, the, you know, because it, it just says, okay. God created, maybe he he fine-tuned the universe at the beginning, yeah. and then he just let things run on their own. Well, that doesn't solve any of these problems downstream in biology because they're 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 then attributing creativity to the standard Darwinian uh, mechanisms or those mechanisms that have been proposed to supplement the mutation selection mechanism, but none of those solve problems like this. And then you have, as I point out in the book, other even deeper problems in that that you, you, there's not enough information in the fine tuning or in the, the configuration of elementary particles or the plasma at the beginning of the universe to account for the information you need to build a biological cell. And I have a way of showing that very graphically 
in, in the book by looking at the DNA molecule and showing that even if you have all the parts of the DNA molecule, there are no forces of self-organization that will determine the sequencing that, sequencing that constitutes the information that the DNA holds. And so if there's no, if there are no chemical, physical chemical forces relevant to, if, if the subunits, the highly biologically relevant and much more complex subunits of DNA do not have self-organizing forces that can account for the information that DNA uh, contains, then a fortiori so much the more, the much less complex, less biologically relevant elementary particles or plasma at the beginning of the universe did not have those mm -hmm. uh, that information or, or or such forces either. And so the front end loaded idea just does not work scientifically. Uh, the evidence suggests that there were informational inputs after the beginning of the universe, which is contra deism, but yeah. also contra deistic evolution, especially in that model of, 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 of front end loading. And just to be clear, I'm not saying that the theistic evolutionists are deists because they do hold that God is actively upholding the laws of nature. Um, and and, and this, cons his conservation of the of the you know, of the laws of nature. The preservation or conservation or there's upholding. no concursive action at all. There's no action. There's no discrete yeah. action. And so they want to limit God's. And this gets back to the question you asked about divine action. They want to limit divine action to one of the two powers that the medieval theologians affirmed. Right. Um, they affirmed that God, there were two powers, at least. One was the ordinary power, which they called the potentia ordinata, where God upheld the laws of nature. The book of uh, Hebrews says that God sustains the universe by the word of his power. There's a sustaining power. He sustains the orderly concourse of nature. But he can also act as an agent within the matrix of natural law that he otherwise sustains and upholds. In other words, he can act discreetly at specific points in time that reveal in a more uh, obvious way to us the reality of his, his, his action. Which is and also think, Romans 1, 18 through 32. Sure, sure. Right, as well. And, and so this is what I think we see with these abrupt appearance, the abrupt appearance of the origin of life, the origin of animals. Um, Gunter Beckley and I wrote an article about the, the 19 different fossil explosions. And in my view, there's absolutely no reason to, to deny some role, uh, some, some form of divine action at those points when we see these large increases in biological information in our biosphere. If we know that it takes a mind to generate information, when we see a large increase in same, then we have, I think, at least prima facie, uh, evidence of, of divine action in a more discreet and discernible way uh, than we we see in the 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 the, the, the constant upholding of regularity right and so, and so yeah. go ahead Lenny yes yeah, even even and you bring up a point because even in uh, I'm seeing in certain sections of biological origin origin that uh, Darwin's tree is actually in doubt that you have oh, uh, certainly i mean we have fossil discontinuity we now have genomic discontinuity with orphan genes that are pervasive across the uh phylogenetic landscape um the the tree of life is you know it's been with us for 160 years but it's not really it's not consistent with many classes of yeah bio. i think there was a panel discussion i saw where dawkins was sitting with j craig ventner and, and ventner offered some of these critiques and Dawkins almost came off of his chair saying, are you, are you actually doubting the, the tree of life? But no, yeah. So we, um, of course we don't see the tree of life. The tree of life is an inference from five main classes of biological evidence. And what I've argued is that, um, that those evidences are either now obsolete or they're equivocal. Uh, and that there are other classes of evidence that are suggesting a polyphyletic picture of the history of life, uh, where you have multiple different groups, and some of which are uh, can be depicted as a, a tree. It, the relationships between some of the groups can be depicted in a tree-like way, but um, but where the relationship between all of the groups does not um, is not best depicted as a single tree, but rather maybe an orchard of separate trees. Uh, so. We, we don't deny that there are evolutionary processes, that the theory of Dar neo-Darwinism has 
applicability within a limited scope, uh, but it does not seem to be the universally applicable account of biological phenomena that it was presented to be even as late as 1959. Well, Stephen, I I want to get, uh, so yeah, on the this was something that I wanted to really dig into a little bit because it bothered me a few years back. I was at an, uh, a, the a theology conference here in the area in Los Angeles, very well-known theology conference, and it was on theological anthropology and uh, almost all of the panel speakers uh, at some point referenced intelligent design, and they were just so dismissive. I, I mean, part of it is I don't think they really had engaged directly with your work, Behe's work, you know, uh, Doug Axe's work, and so on and so forth. They were just getting it from, a lot of them were, were British. They were just getting it from sort of the biologists that they knew. Um, but that dismissal bothered me, not only because I didn't think they really had done their homework as theologians. I think it's kind of, I think it's kind but of. You have a quote here in the, here, let me do it's my Peter Robinson. A tell. It's a tell though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, if people dismiss ideas without representing them accurately, yeah. much less refuting them, it's a tell. It's an absolute yeah. tell of their uh, own insecurity about their own position. Yeah, I don't think they were well informed. And but there's this point of upset. We had a student one year who was at Oxford. And uh, he was in, in our summer seminar, and, uh, and he said, you know, I can't tell you the number of times intelligent design has come up in my classes, but it's always with this very facile, uh, um, snide Yes, dispel. yes, that's exactly it's the way it was treated. Directly. And it's just made all of us more curious about what it is, you know? And yeah. so if you're learning molecular or cell biology, and you're seeing these amazing uh, processes uh, at work, the information processing in DNA replication or in gene expression. I, I remember when I first took courses in, in these courses, a fellow classmates would just say things like, no way, no way, that's awesome. How does it know to do that? I mean, you know, it's just, so the term intelligent design, I think, was actually a fairly bold, bold stroke because it really very aptly uh, uh, um, captures what many biologists, biology students are just seeing in their classes when they're learning about these processes. Regardless um, of their prior religious... Uh, exactly. exactly. And, and so this is yeah. weird protesting too much from the professorate. And I, I would find that rather delightful, actually. Yeah. So. No, I was frustrated. This was in uh, 2018. And and I'm, I'm looking like the, these, I mean, these are academic theologians working at out of Cambridge and stuff, and 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 I'm like, they're not really engaging with they're, the, the they're actual just material. They're just hearing it from their science buddies who probably have yeah. other theological and metaphysical commitments. But so let me let me read this quote. I'll do my I, Peter I Robinson. Call that, Tony, I call that the all reasonable people agree phenomenon. Yeah, you know, they're just, you know, <laughs> right. they're or they're not. To say they're part of the all reasonable people. So so this is from page two fifty eight in the book. Um, Quote, uh, Stephen Meyer, yet many theologians made defensive by the long intellectual dominance of scientific materialism and the history of failed proofs for the existence of God have been reluctant to consider the possibility that scientific evidence could have implications supportive of theistic beliefs, period, end quote. And I maybe that's why I saw it. people have been so browbeaten uh in the theological world because of the scientific materialism that is now we say waning that there's also a sort of a real hesitation and you guys you know coming in with very strong arguments and and hopefully that that needle is shifting but but i will say i think let me make a when we might we, we talked about then this is an interventionist view of God's divine action. There are new inputs of information. We're de detecting this in very specific historical instances, Cambrian explosion, new body plans, etc. The mechanism itself does not have the is not causally sufficient to be self-creating, self-replicating, self-making. Um, but the, there's the another Darwinian, you're saying the, it's not the Darwinian mechanism, right? But now there's another aspect of God's um, providence that I think maybe maybe is leading people to want to go to a more front-loaded view, and that is God's governance, right? That God is directing and guiding all things to certain purposes and ends. 
And this is where I think the problem of evil certainly raises its head. We say, like, look, we to explain novel body parts and all these things, there's an influx of information. There's intervention there. But then the problem of evil raises has its head, and we've heard these objections. Yeah, but what can, about can what, look, yeah, yeah, go ahead. There, you know, this term intervention is used as a sort of pejorative. And now, I'm uh, not using it that way, but uh, yeah. No, I, I understand that. And and it's a fine, fine way of describing it if you like, but I think it's it's better not to think of God intervening as if nature was something that could exist separate from himself. Uh, the, the 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 biblical view uh and the, the and I think of a theologically astute view is that God is upholding the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. He's maintaining the existence of the universe on a moment by moment basis um colossians 1 which uh, newton virtually paraphrased in uh, in the general scolium to the principia uh, uh, says that in christ all things are held together there's a, there's an uh, you know na nature has a, an autonomous existence from god it is semi-autonomous. It would not exist if God did not choose to hold it in existence and maintain its the regular concourse of nature. So to say that God is intervening into that as if it was something wholly separate from his activity right. is 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 maybe not the best term. But I, right. I would just say concursus in the Latin really better translates to participation or accompaniment, not sure. not or, intervention. Or, yeah. or the idea, or the idea that just that that you have discrete divine action yeah. and ongoing divine action. This was the distinction between the, the two potentias, the potentia right. absoluta uh, and the potentia ordinata. Anyway, I'm not a theologian, but I think some of these theological concepts are helpful. What's happened is that the, the theistic evolutionists have wanted to confine divine action to one modality. Yeah. And that's that's a violation of that's in, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's in deference, I think, to the dominant naturalistic or materialistic um zeitgeist of right you know science over the last 150 years but i i my only point and is just that i don't see evidentially a need to do that in fact the evidence on its face seems to point towards many instances of discrete action not just not just one at the origin of life or one at the beginning of the universe and, and isn't that how god relates to us spiritually as well if 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 the project of our human existence on this earth uh, as Christians is uh, soul, partially at least soul making capacities in, in order to shape us morally. Doesn't God intervene spiritually in our lives and we are new creations as well. So, so theologically you can see that that's a, that's a, a common pattern. That's, that's how he normally acts both in the material world, but also in the spiritual realm. Yeah. I have found that in my personal life that, he shows up when you need him. So, Stephen, but then what about the objection of look at all the predation, look at all the uh, animal life that's gone in and out of existence over the millennia? I mean, which then there's a perception there, perhaps, that this can't be governed by a divine agent. So, I mean, and again, it's the problem of, especially in this case, maybe... Um, natural evil so what would be your response to to that object which you've dealt with several times of course but yeah well it's a it's a it's a challenging question um my general uh, approach is uh or my my answer to the the question in general terms is to say that we uh should expect two things when we look at nature if we are looking at it from a biblical point of view. I'm a proponent of intelligent design, but I'm also a biblical theist. And I think biblical theism has explanatory resources with respect to that problem that simply the theory of intelligent design uh, simpliciter does not. So as a biblical advocate, a biblical theist who is an advocate of the theory of intelligent design, I expect to see two things in nature. I expect to see evidence as Romans 1 puts it, from the things that are made of the wisdom and power of the creator. Um, and I think we do see that uh, in the book that you're holding is a docu you know, providing chapter and verse or documentation of that claim. But I think from a biblical point of view, we also, we not only know that from the things that are made, you can 
see these un the unseen qualities of the creator as power and divine wisdom, we also should expect that the creation is in some is somehow in bondage to decay. This is in the same book in the New Testament, the book of Romans, where Paul describes the way in which the things that are made reveal the creator. He also is very explicit in um, affirming that there's something that's gone wrong in nature and that just as if you look at an automobile, you can see the evidence of design in the structure of the internal combustion engine. You can also see evidence of decay in the rust on the engine or on the chassis. And the one does not negate the reality of the other. Both, both things, uh, initial design and subsequent decay are present. And this is what the, 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 the biblical witness leads us to expect. We should expect to see these two things. And so I think some of the arguments for natural theology, especially in the natural in the 19th century, uh, uh, tended so much to emphasize the um, the positive case for Aboriginal design uh, that they overlooked this second aspect of what we should see in nature. You had a kind of almost Platonic view of nature that viewed. Um, or a Leibnizian view that said that you know what we see in nature is the best of all possible worlds. There's no there are no problems, but um, I think we should we as biblical Christians should expect to see both evidence of design and evidence of subsequent decay. That we see both of those things in nature, I think, is confirmatory of the hypothesis that you would generate based on a, a biblical metaphysic. Uh, so yeah. that's that's the general way I look at it, and we there's there's stuff about viruses and and uh, bacteria and I mean, a, a colleague of mine uh, Scott Minnick works on virulence and it happens that he tells me that microbiologists that work on virulence now know that that all the really nasty bugs that we have have acquired those nasty capabilities vis-a-vis -vis humans as a consequence of a loss of genetic information which I think is what you'd expect from the kind of view that we hold that there was a, a, a an aboriginal creation that was purely good and there has been decay of that um and then there's a theological backstory to that that we're partially told but not entirely so i don't think we have a full answer to it but in ge very general terms what we see is exactly what we should expect right no and, and to get on, into on a, on a, biblical, on a biblical view, yeah that the, would the, be the topic for me is, is not just the problem created by humans but there's a there's the, it's it's reflect it in some way has played itself out in nature in and nature. there are different theories about how that has happened and i have i have views on that but you know i don't think yeah. we have the whole story we're given we're given a glimpse into a backstory but we don't get the whole story as to how that arose yeah, we're not. We won't do a uh, another hour here on theodicies. Maybe we'll another yeah. save that for another time. Okay, should, that's my like yeah. colleague Dempsey, who's written a very interesting book on that. So yeah. Um, okay, so I want to I want to start uh, drawing to a close here um, with maybe a, uh, just a few more practical kind of questions um, for you. I think we've we've covered uh, the book pretty well. Some of the metaphysical options why theism uh, is the best option, and then also some of these questions about God's discrete divine action in the course of uh, natural history. Um, so, so for you then, working with in, I, in this field with Discovery Institute, you've been, were you one of the found, were you on board from the beginning with Discovery or you came on Relatively yeah, well, early not from the life. institute, but with yeah. the program at the Center for Science and Culture, John West and I founded yeah. that in 1996. Discovery was founded by George Gilder and Bruce Chapman in 1990. Yeah. So, what um, um, what are these? What would you hope for the evidence, the arguments you're making, and how ID can influence um, the church? Maybe, as we said, the project of theology, our theology. And and also the individual believer. How might this work out in the life of the individual believer? Um, I think we should have uh, in people who believe in God should have a lot more confidence in their belief than they often feel they have a right to today, given the dominant and long dominant secular ethos. And uh, we've actually had a, a PhD student who did a uh, a survey 
uh, did a study showing that uh, students that are taught about the theory of intelligent design, uh, then it was a longitudinal study, um, <clears throat> students that are taught about intelligent design have a higher confidence in their faith um, down the road, more there's a higher degree, high, higher degree of faith retention and a greater degree of confidence in their faith, measure, measured in part by their willingness to share it, than people who are not taught about these evidences. So, I think you know the it, it it's it's I mean I have I still have epiphanies about this. You know when you're thinking there there is a digital code inside every cell of every living organism. Uh, Bill Gates says it's like a software program. Where does software come from? It comes from a programmer. We're, we're looking at this. Is this should be a stop press moment in the history of science and history of biology? The discovery of of this information and information processing system. It's it's a clear evidence of of of, of a higher uh, of the activity of of a higher intellect of a master programmer. Um, when you have those sorts of evidences as part of what roots your 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 belief. Um, it has more ballast, and and, uh, and I think people should have more confidence. There's there's the case for theism is very very strong. Um, as for but I, I want to answer a question you didn't ask, which is about the, the benefits for science. Well, that uh, that because, was my next question about the okay, well, there, yeah because <laughs> this is what we're working yeah. on now. Is, you know, a lot of scientists will see the problems with Darwinism, and not see that those the problems that they're seeing. For example, the presence of the circuitry that is involved in making body plans is the flip side of a positive case for design. The only known cause of circuitry or things that function like circuits is, is, is intelligence, it's engineering. Um, and so we're not just maybe, we're not just being confronted with something that's problematic for Darwinism, we're, we're being confronted with evidence that is best explained by the activity of a designing agents. Uh, moreover, intelligent design doesn't just explain uh, d d doesn't just provide a better explanation of facts that we have long had. It actually helps. It, it has ex we have expectations. It generates expectations about what we should see in life because we know something about the way designing agents act and the kinds of things that they generate, the kinds of um, signatures that are associated with, with intelligent activity. And so we ought, to, we ought for example, to uh, find design patterns that are known from uh, computer science um, in the information processing system in the cell. And in fact, we're finding things like that. Um, we, there was a very important prediction that ID people made in the 90s and 2000s about the so-called junk DNA. The Darwinists had concluded that the non-coding regions of the genome, the parts that weren't coding for proteins, were um, simply the leftover of the random trial and error process of mutation and selection, that they were junk. And we said, well, we accept that mutation and selection is a real process. There ought to be a little of that, but not 97% of the genome. Uh, if it was designed, we'd expect a much higher percentage of the genome to be functional. So we're going to predict that those non-coding regions are not junk, but are in importantly functional. And it turns out, post-encode project 2011, they absolutely are importantly functional, and that that the the non-coding regions are involved in the timing, the regulation of the of the timing and expression of the of the data files of the of the modules that that build the proteins. Uh, so, uh, ID is leading to predictions of that sort that are guiding research, and that's very a very exciting aspect of a dynamic research program. So looking at life as a design system, we think will prove to be and is proving to be more fruitful than looking at life as the product of a bottom-up, unguided process that was uh, blind and what was the, the docket? Yeah. Pitiless, pitiless, which is a different yeah, kind of no, it, yeah. That's not, it doesn't look, that's not, the things we're seeing don't look as if they were produced by that type of a process. Well, and that's, I think, and one thing I haven't, you know, I was thinking about, and maybe there's some research to be done here too, is with this, with this framework of looking at the natural world and discerning in, in more and more detail uh, design, it really liberates us to think about what we would norm call in classical philosophy, final causation. Things are, you know, are, are designed for a purpose. They're moving towards an aim. 
And then I would wonder about how that might revivify a certain kind of natural law thinking that I think we desperately need in the culture as well. So I don't know if anybody's working on that, but that might be a project there on how. Oh, there's a uh, huge project there. Um, yeah. Mr. McIntyre, after virtue, you know, this yeah. whole idea yeah. that um, uh, the, the moral law is not something that has been imposed upon humankind uh, to deprive us of, of, of fun, but it rather is to promote human flourishing. Flourishing. In other words, it was designed for our benefit. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was given to match our design for our benefit. So I think the notion of design is, I think, very important in moral philosophy. Yeah, now I look forward to seeing more more done there. Okay, last uh, maybe two questions here. I got a bonus question for you, but it won't take you uh, off, but uh, surprise you too much, I think. Um, so for the the pastor, the average uh, average Christian, not, not that there is such a thing, but how can people get more uh, engaged with the ID movement? um be more supportive of it um discovery institute what what can what can people do to contribute uh, to the project right now there's a, a little if you go to my website or to one of the, any of the websites on um uh the discovery institute there's a little sign up page to get a free booklet uh uh on the scientific evidence for god and in in getting the free booklet all you have to do is provide your email but then once you have the email, then you're part of our network and we can send you information about conferences and updates on uh, new de scientific developments and uh, become a supporter if you want. I mean, it's so that's that's one real practical way. Um, if you go to stephencmeyer.org or discoveryinstitute.org, uh, you can you can uh, sign up, get that free booklet. I think we put this up for all the interest we were generating because of the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, but it's a. Uh, and so we're we're getting quite a lot of traffic as a result of that, which is great. Oh, that um, is good. That is good. Yeah. Also, um, you know, we we sometimes say we do wholesale. We need a lot of help with retail. We've got lots of YouTube video shorts, our science uprising series, a fine little video called uh, um, the Information Enigma. Uh, sharing this material with with people who are are wrestling with these big questions is something that we are. Uh, is very much needed and we very much appreciate when when people get involved in that way we also have a um, a um, a small donor society called our discovery society and people that want to join that can are invited every year to a, a an insider's briefing this year we're having it in washington dc yep, i'll be there i'll see you there yeah so yeah there's lots of ways to get involved at Go to uh, discovery.org or stephencmeyer.org uh, right now, and you'll there's ways to click and and connect. Yeah, I would really encourage. I've I've benefited greatly from being um, a supporter of Discovery Institute the last couple of years. I've gotten to meet you once or twice now. I think uh, once at Biola and then a couple of weeks ago again. And um, of course, I know Doug Axe a little bit, um, and uh, really just and Eric Schneider. And it's just been great. It's been great to interact with you guys and uh, really appreciative of all the work you've done. Uh, so I would strongly encourage people to get the books, read the material, and then also get involved as well in the project. All right, Stephen, I got one bonus question for you because uh, last time we met, I found out you were a boxing fan like myself. So I got to ask you, Spence versus, no question. Yeah. Spence versus Crawford, who do you got? Oh, yeah, Crawford's pretty tough, I think. Yeah. Going Crawford. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Interesting backstory there. Uh, uh, Brian Callen uh, yeah. is, had just, when I did the interview and debate, sort of debate conversation with Michael Shermer on his show, he'd just come back from sparring at Bernard Hopkins's gym. Oh, really? He, oh, man. He, he's a boxer. The executioner. And so we, we had quite a conversation before the interview started about the the noble art, the sweet science, and oh, uh, various ha techniques. Hagler was my guy. I was a Hagler fan. He found out I had a Russian coach, so we talked a fair amount of, of technique. But uh, anyway, um, I I think I partially owe the invitation to Rogan to Brian Callen because they're they're childhood friends. And they're oh, very, really? Very, 
What both what a the, stroke of providence! The fight game in a different way. Callan being a boxer, but uh, um, Rogan, the the MMA star, who's had an extraordinary career. Those guys are scary tough. I, would, I wouldn't get anywhere right. near anyone. Yeah, right. Well, that's they, good. Well, they have all the different tools, you know. With the, it's going to be a great fight either way. This is one I'm really looking forward to. But um, uh, well, Stephen, this has been excellent. I really appreciate you. Uh, taking the time now that I mean you're busier than ever I'm sure um, and uh, but it's it's been a blessing to have you here and look forward to maybe doing it again another time on uh, on some of the other issues that we didn't have time to get into so thanks for coming on the Kirkwood Center podcast and we'll see you next time yes. yeah, excellent well thank you guys great questions so plumbed the philosophical depths of a lot of this in some new ways so I love it thank you great Thank you so yeah. much.